Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T for C. Are you interested in engineering and science? What about space exploration? Then this is the episode for you because my next guest is a senior engineer at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That's also known as NASA's JPL. And as a senior engineer, he spends his days helping to make sure different NASA missions, whether to Mars or Jupiter or another planet, get off without a hitch. But before I introduce you to Fred Sirikio, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's time for Coffee's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays to give you an exclusive look into the episodes and the professionals we're going to be featuring that week. And it is so easy to do, so much easier to do than being a senior engineer at NASA's JPL, I promise you. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign-up box is right there. Now, my Java-loving Jupiter junkies, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Fred Sirikio, a senior engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Fred has worked at NASA's JPL for almost 26 years and today is a technical group supervisor overseeing the guidance and control systems engineering group. Over the last quarter century, Fred has worked on countless projects, including the Mars rover, and that is both Mars Spirit and Opportunity, its Attitude Control Systems, also known as ACS, as well as developing and implementing the autonomous control system for a deep drilling mechanism in the Mars Exploration Program. He's also the cruise ACS lead on the Mars Science Laboratory, completing controller performance analysis, algorithm development, kinematic and dynamic modeling, and simulation of flight system. Completing flight operations from launch to landing, including all turns, calibrations, parameter, alignment updates, and TCMS, which stands for Train Control and Management System. And by the way, I had to look that up because I have no idea what TCMS is, and it comprises computer devices and software, human machine interfaces, digital and analog input output capability, as well as the data networks required to connect all of these components together in a secure and fault resistant manner. Did I get that right, Fred? Unfortunately, no. TCMs are trajectory correction maneuvers. Basically, small little pushes on our way between here and Mars. Because we're not going directly to Mars when we launch, we need to make sure that we end up at a specific time and place in space. So along the way, we're tracking where it's going, and we do a few of these maneuvers along the way to make sure that when it comes time for landing, we're actually where we're supposed to be so that the land can happen properly. Okay. Thank goodness I interrupted my introduction here to ask you because as I said, this is very new to me and there is so much more to Fred's experience and expertise, but I don't want to throw any more acronyms and wonky words at you and misinform you. I want to leave it to Fred to bring all of this to life. Fred, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I am. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I want to let our listeners know that if they want to learn more about what you do as a senior engineer at NASA and how you built your career, they should please check out the show notes for this episode to see if Fred's main Time for Coffee interview has already dropped. Okay, let's get into our 10 espresso shots. These are the 10 questions that we have to help our Jupiter-loving Java junkies learn how to break into the world of engineering in the field of space exploration, which not only includes federal agencies like NASA, where you work right now, Fred, but also 
commercial entities. These are satellite and space tourism, like Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic, as well as Elon Musk's SpaceX and Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin, which plans to start sending people and payloads to Earth's orbit and beyond. So first question, Fred, what entry-level jobs are available to young people who are eager to break into this field? Basic entry-level jobs are really summer internships or even co-ops. Those are open to college-level freshmen, all the way on to students who are on the way to a PhD. So before they actually end up getting a degree, they can actually work for those entities and do meaningful work, the same type of work that we would be doing, but just for some reason got put low on the to-do list, but actually needs to get done. So That's really the first place where someone can come in and start. That's awesome. And I only learned about a co-op very, very recently for our young listeners who may not be familiar with co-ops. Could you explain what they are? Sure. That's really an extended internship where it's a summer and one semester, and you can actually get credit for it from your college and university. And it, it lets you do something a little more substantial than something that can be done in 10 to 14 work summertime. So you get to do a little little more work, a little more in-depth, and actually can produce a little more work for your supervisor or for the projects that you work on yeah. and get a little more real-world experience. Absolutely. And in fact, the young woman who I interviewed who did that while she was an undergrad now has a full-time job at the place where she was working in this co-op program, and it happens to be Harley-Davidson. So it's excellent. Cool. Yeah. So what is a useful skill or skills that you look for, Fred, in the young people that you hire? When we interview, we assume that the schools are teaching them the right things. So there's a little piece of the, the interview that's technical. But really what we want is enthusiasm for space exploration, the intellectual curiosity to basically put your hard work into these missions that could take three to seven to 10 years to develop and actually end up going to the places they're supposed to go. We want to make sure that people look back on the projects and group work that they did in school, learn from it, learn from the things that worked, learn from the things that didn't work, so that they can actually reflect on that and apply it to the next time they have to do something. Yeah, and I'm also guessing, because right now what you've mentioned is, yes, obviously the hard skills that you would learn in school, but it sounds like especially when it comes to enthusiasm, that's a soft skill. Absolutely. I mean, the ability to work hard is a great skill, but in order to keep up that motivation, you need to have the long-term end goal of this mission doing its space exploration outfit, a comet, an asteroid, or a different planet. These missions aren't short-term, one year or less type of projects. So you need to have the kind of enthusiasm that will carry you through the hard work that it takes to go from a mission concept to successfully actually doing the thing it's supposed to do at Mars or or Jupiter or Europa. Do you think that you were mentally prepared for those kinds of timeframes when you started at JPL 26 years ago? Not really. I was a patient person, but I don't think that I had that kind of delayed gratification skill built up yet. So it's something that you can learn, but Getting through the day-to-day meetings and work and simulations and analysis and restarting takes a lot of that skill built up over time. I think it's very appropriate that while we're doing this interview, I think it was a helicopter just flew over my house. So I don't know if anybody could hear that, but those aren't sound effects. That was actually a real helicopter flying over my house. How did you develop that patience? How did you learn to curate it? A lot of the activities I was participating in outside of school are in the delayed gratification category like exercise and whatnot where the benefits aren't there the day you're doing the hard work or hard exercise there years down the road. So it's something that was built up over time. So you just took that experience, that mindset that you were cultivating in your extracurricular activities and applied it to your professional work. Absolutely. And it wasn't something I set out to do. It's not like I'm saying I'm trying to learn my delayed gratification skill. It's just something that happened a little more organically. But just like everything else, if you put time to it, you can develop it consciously or unconsciously. Fantastic. What about life experiences, Fred? So 
These are the kinds of experiences that most of us would have outside the classroom. What do you think are the most helpful ones to have for someone starting out in this field? Anything that sparked your passion for space exploration, because on almost every interview I, I have with incoming bachelor's, master's, or PhD student, they, they talk about when they were five years old and took a tour of Johnson Space Center or Kennedy Space Center or saw something exciting happen in space exploration history. And that's the thing that made them want to go to school and want to get an engineering or science degree. Those are the things that like stick with people their entire lives. Those are the things that basically spark their curiosity and spark their hard work and drive. And then 20 years later, they follow through and actually got their degree, got their PhD and want already very enthusiastic about applying that to something exciting. I was struck by something I read on NASA's website as I was preparing for this interview, and it has to do with naming contest for Mars 2020. And they feature an interview with a young woman who I guess won the contest a number of years ago for Mars Curiosity. That was the name that they picked. And I thought that was so incredible because she says that the fact that her suggestion made it through all of the others showed her that her voice mattered and it ended up inspiring her to go and study engineering in college. And now I believe she's in the process of getting her PhD. I mean, it's really incredible. So something as seemingly random as participating in a contest, like what name do you think we should give to the next rover, can end up changing someone's life. It's exciting because when I remember the, when she won the contest, because they give her a tour of JPL, she gets to go through the mission ops area. We were all taking pictures with her and we remember her because when she was 10 or 12 at the time, I don't even remember how old she was, but it brings excitement and realism to the rover. Because before that, we were just calling it the MSL rover, the MSL rover. It wasn't until she gave it a name that it became a living entity for us, too. Passion goes both ways. Oh, that's so wonderful. And she actually does talk about what it was like meeting the real people who were working on getting Mars Curiosity into space. So I couldn't agree with you more. It was that whole 360 experience for her that made a difference. But again, these are life experiences that anyone can have. Anyone can participate in a naming contest. And the naming contest for the 2020 rover is going on right now. Yeah, actually, yes, it is. It may have just closed. For for submitting new new names, it could. Yeah, I think the name part had just closed like November 7th. And we're just a couple days before Thanksgiving when we're doing this interview, but they haven't announced it yet. It's going to be announced, I think, in January. So that's kind of exciting to to wait and see what that name's going to be. Fred, is someone's major a deciding factor to get into your profession? In other words, if they haven't studied fill in the blank, is it a deal breaker? They need some sort of engineering or science degree, whether it's a bachelor's, master's, or PhD, any one of those. But they do need to have some some engineering or physics background. Math is also a good one to have, but they do need some sort of advanced degree. Yeah, I would have been really surprised if you had said no. I think that's a very comforting thought to know that. What about a grad school degree? And Maybe less so for the entry-level positions, but I don't know. Maybe they are required for entry-level. More so for someone who wants to succeed in your field, who wants to make it up to being a senior engineer or similar titles. And if so, what are the most useful ones to have? At JPL, it's typically a third bachelor's degree, a third master's, and a third PhD. And in each group and section... There's different breakdowns for that. And in our section, it's about the same. In my particular group, it's PhD heavy to where probably 75 or 80 percent of my group has PhDs. I have a master's and whether you do a master's with coursework only or with a thesis, those are choices that you make as student and depending on what you want to do for the rest of your 
career. But the more education and more classwork you get, the more ready you'll be to actually apply those skills to different areas within GNC. And the field is pretty math heavy, so you can't overtake the number of math advanced controls and dynamics. And the learning continues even after you, you start the job. You also have on-the-job learning and training for things that you have a master's and you didn't take a particular course. And, and there's experts here that actually will mentor and coach you. Great. Are there particular kinds of graduate degrees that are more useful than others? Some of it depends on what you would like to do. If you're going to become an expert in something, then PhD is where you will end up. You can be more of a generalist as a master's degree student. The trouble, the difference between those two is that as a PhD, you take a lot more classes than a one-year master's program. And there's master's with thesis, which is a little closer to a PhD, but it's not six-year undertaking. What about the subject matter, though, in terms of, you know, getting a master's in quantum physics versus applied mathematics? That's a good point. If you have a mechanical engineering undergraduate degree, you can get a master's degree in aeronautics. And that's a good compliment or with a minor in math. Those are the types of balances that are actually quite useful because the more versatile you are, the more creativity you'll actually bring to the problem solving that has to happen for creating mission scenarios and solving the complicated problems that, that will come up. Yeah, no doubt. So, Fred, what is the best part for you of being in this profession? It's getting to explore the solar system, flying a rover to another planet, having it land there and drive around. And I, I was lucky enough to actually be on three of those missions. I got to do that. And it's the pursuit of science and scientific discovery. Because as much fun as it is just landing a rover on another planet, it's really bringing the whole science package that sits on the rover to go explore the new region that we may have never been to before and actually come up with some new scientific discoveries. So when you say you actually got to drive around the rover, do you mean that from JPL, you were like behind the controls? I was behind the controls while we were doing surface operations. Unfortunately, wasn't the person who hit the button to send the commands, but I was part of the engineering team that was coming up with the sequences and commands to send to the rover and to do its activities. There's a whole chain of command of how the commands that we will send to the rover will actually get executed. And there's only one person who's allowed to hit the button to send those commands for that day or that activity. Got it. But what was that like seeing the commands? And I'm guessing it's a particular kind of a formula that you're sending. Is that right? to see that then translate into various movements that are happening hundreds of thousands of miles a, away. Absolutely. It's, it's a series of commands. We basically send the rover a day's worth of activities to do. They get sent up. There's a one-way light time of between 7 and 15 or 20 minutes. So it takes that long to get there. The rover gets all those commands. It starts to execute those sequences. And halfway through the day, it may send some of the telemetry down to tell us how far along it made it during that day. Uh, then we look at the data, which is basically numbers on the screen that we interpret that are power levels. There's high level telemetry and low level motor commands and voltages and currents and those sorts of things. But then at the end of the day, it sends down all the pictures it took. And that's really where it's like this particular place on Mars is the first time that a picture was ever taken of it. We get to see that with our own eyes for the very first time. And then they all get released to the public and, they, and everyone gets to see it. But the real fun is actually sitting in the chair and being blown away by every picture that comes down, even though it looks a lot like Mars. But this is the first time that particular place has ever been seen by any human eyes. So it's very lucky to be part of that. Do you get chills? Almost every time. I'm getting chills just listening to you talk about it. I just can't even imagine how exciting that must be. It's excellent. And then the surprise in the scientists' faces, because these are the experts in the field and the geology, and when they see a new place on Mars and they see the discoveries they're about to make, they get the chills. And it's like, these are the experts who know everything there is to know about Mars, and they're still learning more as we do these things. So oh. that's the reason for the whole scientific exploration. Absolutely. So as we know, every job, I don't care how cool it is, has aspects to it 
that aren't so much fun. So what is the part of your current job as a senior engineer at NASA that sucks the most? There are a lot of meetings and a lot of bureaucracy. And some of that has been built up over past failures because you want to make sure that you don't make the same mistake twice. And the way that we kind of implement that within the agency is you have to learn from those mistakes so there's more paperwork and process along the way. Sometimes that helps a lot. Sometimes it's just a lot of paperwork and process. So that's the least favorite part of it because we're, we're spending taxpayers' dollars and we want to make sure that we're successful in the missions we try and do. So we have to be extra careful with that. But it tends to create a lot of meetings and a lot of bureaucracy. Yeah. I am not a fan of that either, but I think that it sounds to me as if it's there for a really good reason. So it is. I guess that makes that bitter pill easier to swallow. (laughs) Fred, what is the best career advice you've ever gotten? Be willing to take opportunities that are offered and available to you. Because sometimes they don't come around very often. And I was always under the impression, I want to make sure I'm 100% ready for the next job I'm about to take, rather than jumping in and trying it and learning it as I go and getting help when I need it and you know, possibly not, not doing a great job and learning how to do a better job in that particular role. So there were probably a few opportunities I could have taken that I hadn't. And once I started doing that, I got more responsibility and more ownership of certain things and more opportunities presented themselves. So don't be afraid to jump in early and get asked for help. People wouldn't put you in a role that you're going to fail in. So you'll get the support you need and you can ask for the support you need. And if it wasn't a great fit, then that's not the end of the world. How did you deal with making mistakes? I'm assuming you did make mistakes. Absolutely. And how did you roll with those punches? I asked for the help. Once those mistakes were made, I put in the work with the people who could give me that help. I wasn't afraid to ask for help and ask for guidance and assistance before the mistake was even made. A lot of this bureaucracy is built in to provide that guidance. So a lot of the reviews we actually have are to make sure that as an institution, the entire product we deliver is good. So some of that is actually in place for exactly those reasons. And a review may be rough if we're not 100% ready for that in certain areas, but that's to ensure mission success and to make sure that the entire process is successful. Absolutely. And I'm guessing that in addition to making mistakes, you also realized because you were pushing yourself outside your comfort zone, you were probably growing in ways that you wouldn't otherwise have grown. That's correct. Yes. I mean, there's skills that weren't my strengths that you have to turn your weaknesses into your strengths. I mean, that's like something that people say all the time, but that's something that will help you grow as an individual. And the more you do that, the better you will be in your next role at that company or institution or or the, the next one you go to. Can you give us an example, Fred, of something that you would call a weakness of yours and how you were able to turn it into a strength? Some of the early architecture trades and big picture decisions that have to be made early on. Those are the things where you really only can make the right choices. if You've had a lot of experience and seen a lot of other missions through their entire life cycle. So it's not something as a fresh out of college, you'll have any bearing on how you would make those choices. It's something that comes from having done these types of things a few times and seeing other projects do those. Yeah. I have to tell you, listening to that example, Fred, I personally wouldn't have described that as a weakness. I would have described that as just something very natural, which is inexperience, right? You've never done this before. And leaning on the people who have done it before and listening to them and forming your own opinions about what worked and what didn't work and folding those in. That's that's the skill that is useful for development. Did you ever identify people, especially in the early years at JPL, that you wanted as mentors? Well, absolutely. And the one person I was lucky enough to work with over the past probably 15 years has acted in that way. I mean, he's, he's literally a super genius among the smart people here at JPL. And we even have a expression that his philosophy is the Miguelian philosophy because his name is Miguel San Martin and he's a just one of the outstanding people who have 
worked here probably 35 years. And if you're doing it the way that Miguel would do it, then you're doing the right thing. And how did you approach him? Did you ever say, Miguel, I'd love to take you out for a cup of coffee or just to talk with you and get some advice because I'm not so sure about this, that, and the other. And you obviously know so much about it. And I'd love to get your counsel on how to do it. Luckily, he was more of the, here's the advice that I want to give you so we can all do this right. He was more more than willing to give the advice. And I was more than willing to listen. Great. So I didn't actually have to seek him out specifically. But there were other people I did have to seek out specifically in other areas, in the areas of planning, staffing, and schedule, and that sort of thing. Because there are other people who are more, really more of an expert in that kind of thing, which is not the technical architecture trades and implementation side of things. It's really more of the upfront planning of how many people do we need on this project to do this and this, that, and the other. How long will it all take? Do that kind of costing and planning. And is that the kind of thing, Fred, that took place kind of outside of the day-to-day? In other words, did you pull them aside because maybe they weren't part of your team or for whatever reason you weren't working super closely together, but you knew they were the expert in planning or in whatever it was? And how did you reach out to them to get that advice? The people I went out to specifically for that help, they're actually in the flow of proving these things. So that's one of the areas where the bureaucracy is good. I can come up with a crazy schedule and cost, and the people who are more experienced from within our section have to approve that cost. So before I actually went to them and said, here's my crazy idea in the meeting where they have to approve it all and have it just be like thrown on the ground, and go back to the drawing board. I went to them, one of them specifically before that meeting and said, here's what I'm thinking. He gave some good, good advice. I went back, thought about it a little more took some of the advice in and reformulated some things. So that's one area where the chain of command and that process does actually help you because they're the ones who are responsible for it. However, if they were not, there were other people within the section who I could also go to who have done this many times before for many missions. And I could have reached out to them for their advice as well. Is this something that is actively encouraged within JPL? Or would you say this is just sort of something that you've initiated on your own? For me, I initiated it on my own, mostly from the sense of when I have the big review where everything's supposed to go right and they're supposed to sign off, I want that to go smoothly. And the more upfront work you can do to make it in as best shape as possible, that's to my benefit. So for me, I tended to initiate it a little more. Other groups and sections, they may have different ways that they do things, but I think it's in everyone's advantage to take the advice and learn how to do it before you actually have to go under the gun in the big meeting to make sure that it's solid. Yeah, that is great advice. Thank you so much, Fred. So two final espresso shots. What movies, if any, or Hulu, Amazon, Netflix shows, or books do you think accurately depict your profession? The one that comes to mind is really The Martian, both the book and the movie. The idea of Overcoming obstacles, failures during the mission and those kinds of setbacks and trying to recover and save either the mission or the astronauts. Those are the things that, and going well above and beyond and coming up with creative solutions and the ingenious ways to get yourself out of an unfortunate situation with limited resources and time. And that's the type of intellectual creativity that exists all within NASA. And that's probably the best depiction that we could could have. Oh, it was such a great movie. Matt Damon was amazing in that role. Loved it. So final espresso shot. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about your profession? Launch a spacecraft to wherever it's supposed to go, whether it's Mars, Comet, Asteroid. We're not just sitting around waiting for it to get there and we'll come back 10 months or a year or seven years later. We're actually doing daily activities to make sure the spacecraft is in good health, it's heading where it's supposed to go, the science instruments get checked out, any of the engineering instruments that get checked out are all uh, make sure they're working correctly, coming up with fixes for things that are breaking or not functioning properly, that sort of thing. So there's really a lot of activity going on, even during the cruise phase, even though the cruise phase sounds very relaxing, but that's really where 
a lot of the, the major activities to make sure that are going to be successful actually get checked out and get worked on. So you're not like just sitting around twiddling your thumbs, drinking cappuccino and reading the sports pages. Exactly. We're not. <laughs> okay, great. Fred, thank you so much for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. You have such a fascinating career and it must be just so incredibly fulfilling to know that the work that you're doing is vital, not only for our national security, but also for the health of this planet. Thank you so much, Fred. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.